Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I've got 241. Let's see. So we've got. To myself. Wanderer today, um, Seafarer next week, Wolf and Edwalker, Wife's Lament, the week after that. Um, and I was thinking of throwing out an option for you. So I want you to think about it. Um, and then you can either send me a tech, uh, send me an email or something. Let me know what you think uh, about this. I think you'll all be in support of it. Um, and I kind of hate to do it, but I'm proposing it for a reason. I'm thinking maybe dropping Malden. Possible. Um, because that's 350 lines, and that's the same day that your paper is due. And I've had at least one person contact me um, with some concern about that. Um, and so if we did drop Malden, um, the only thing that would be due that night, that day, is it the 24th? I was thinking it was the 25th. On the 24th would be your paper. Okay, so we would not have a Zoom session. You would just, you know, be sure to email me your paper. That's one option. The other option is um, put Malden off until December 8th and go ahead. And, oh, shoot, I can't do that. <laughs> Wait, or can I? My daughter's having shoulder surgery that day, but only one of us can be at the hospital with her. Um, so I don't know which one of us is going to be there. I think my wife said I was going to be there. Um, yeah, that one. I'll let you know by next week at the latest. I mean, go ahead and, and let me know what you would prefer. I think I know or have a pretty good idea of more than likely what you would prefer. Um, and I don't, I don't really have a problem doing this. The main reason to read the Battle of Malden is because of the depiction of Birtnoth, the the leader of the English heroes uh, or the English army in about the last 50 lines because the last 50 lines is really only about the last 15, 20 lines uh, contain the most, <coughs> excuse my throat is really sore today. Um, the last 15, 20 lines contain the most succinct expression of the Germanic heroic ethos that there is. I mean, it's just, it just gets distilled in this beautiful, beautiful form. Um, and, and one of the things that's interesting about that is it comes towards the very end of the Old English period. I mean, we, we don't get that expression of this heroic ethos um, a lot earlier. I mean, we see a little bit of it in Dream of the Rood, you know, with Christ ascending on the cross. And we'll talk a little bit about some of it today with, um, with the Wanderer. You don't see it as much in the Seafarer. You don't see it at all in Wolf and the Edwalker or the Wife's Lament. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what you guys think about. So send me an email or, or post something via the um, discussion board, whatever that thing's called. Okay? So let's start with the Wanderer. Um, we won't be here the whole, the whole time again because this, this poem isn't that long, um, 115 lines. And, you know, it's interesting that Marsden, it's interesting that Marsden puts this near the end of the texts in his book because he orders the text according to difficulty. Easier text at the beginning, harder text at the end. Um, well, let me just ask you, did you find this poem hard to translate? I'm seeing Chelsea, no, Cheryl, no, Sarah, no, Laney, no, okay. So in your opinion, why 
Why do you think he puts it towards the end? You're all muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself if you want to respond. Next with the other ones, doesn't it? Like the seafarer and Walker and all of those? Well, uh, it, it kind of does, but the seafarer comes much earlier in the textbook. Um, Wolf and Ed Walker comes right after, if I remember right. Yep. And then the wife's lament is the last one. Okay. Um, I can understand Wolf and Ed Walker and wife's lament being at the end. I could also understand if he were to put Wolf and Ed Walker, not wife's lament as much, um, but we'll put Wolf and Ed Walker next to the riddles because it's, it's not, it's not a classical riddle in the sense that it asks, what am I? But it is kind of riddling-ish, let's say. Um, I mean, it is interesting because, you know, the seafarer, what number is the seafarer? Seafarer, seafarer is number 26. Um, and this is number 38. So seafarer is way back there before Malden, before the bits of Beowulf, um, before Kennewolf and Kennehard, which, you know, if I were arranging this, I'd put Kennewolf and Kennehard probably further towards the end. Um, Kennewolf, Seafarer comes right after Surma Lupi. I mean, it, it, Seafarer is much, much easier. I'm just curious why you think, you see, he doesn't state why he puts things where they are other than they move from complexity from more simple text to more difficult text. Okay. Now, having said that, um, I've not reread the introduction, not even in what I was preparing for today. I was going through and I've, I've pulled out several different translations to talk about some passages. So I don't even remember what he says in here. Uh, yeah, he does raise the question of how many speakers are there in the poem? Bottom of page 375. An attractive interpretation as the poet's first swakwath, referring forwards to the monologue that is about to start, and the second one that comes at the end, referring back to it once, is, once it has ended. Then the outer frame may be attributed to the poet also, who enunciates the Christian precepts which the poem is designed to promote. Alternative interpretations, of which there are several variations, would have the opening closing lines of the the outer frames given to the wanderer himself. One of the kind of critical questions is how many speakers are there in the poem? Is it one speaker? Is it two speakers? Is it possibly three speakers? Another question revolves around what is the true poem and what is interpolated, which means added in, later by a Christian scribe? By a monkish scribe, because there are there are some critics who believe, for example, that when you get down to the end of the poem, um, pretty much from one eleven to the end, that that's all added later. That the original part of the poem is essentially what you get from, and there's some some fudging of where it begins, but what you get from beginning around line eight through line 110. Well, if you, if you drop off lines one through seven and you drop off 111 through 115, it radically changes the meaning of the poem, right? And one of the reasons that's done, back up. One of the reasons suggested that those lines are added is because, according to some critics, they kind of Christianize what is otherwise thought to be a fairly straightforward pagan, um, uh, fairly, for, fairly straightforward representation of pagan thought, okay? And so as we go through, as, as you're translating, I'm going to stop. 
in so that we can discuss at various aspects of it to you know ask okay is this pagan and if it is how is it pagan how, how does it differ from let's say a christian perspective and one of the difficulties of that question is even if one is a christian in the 21st century one's 21st century christianity is radically different from the christianity of a seventh eighth ninth tenth century anglo-saxon poet their their understanding of the quote-unquote faith got a thing telling me that i am the internet connection um that our that a 21st century faith is very very different than it was let's say in the ninth or tenth century An another question of the poem we don't know when it was composed very very few old english poetry old english poems can we actually date i mean we can date the the kennewolf poems they're called the kennewolf poems because he has his name embedded in an acrostic in the poem okay and we know when kennewolf lived we can date some of the poems of some other poets because we know when they lived and we know what they wrote but most of the major poems like most of the poetry in this volume that you're using we don't know who wrote it and we don't know when it was composed dream of the rude we can say well it was part of it early 8th century all of it we're not sure beowulf you'll see next semester the dates range from 700 to its earliest written down form to possibly as late as the first quarter of the 11th century 1025, 1030, some people will say even as late as 1040. Uh, Helen D'Amico in a fairly recent book kind of suggests that. Um, but most of these, the best we can do in one sense is go by the date of the manuscript that contains them. Almost all of those manuscripts date from approximately 975 to 1025. So we know they are around then, right? Okay? How much earlier? we don't know right so let's start um and i had thought of just reading this whole thing through and and then stopping us and we'll go back through um let me read a bunch in old english i don't know how long i'll go because as i said my throat's kind of sore and i still haven't done anything but my eyes <clears throat> so this is I'm making sure I'm reading from the edition you guys are using, which is the second edition on 377. Bear in mind also, I don't remember if I said this before, the titles, like the wander at the top of this, it's not in the manuscript. Dream of the Rude, not in the manuscript. Seafair, none of those titles are in the manuscript. All of those titles are titles that were invented in some of them late 18th, most of them 19th, some early 20th centuries by the first editors, okay? And they came up with this title because of the third word, essentially. So this could just as easily be called the solitary one, the loner kind of a thing, right? Oft him on haga are ye bideth, me to des milta, therthe he mod carry, yon lagulada, longa shelda. Rarin mit hondum, rin caldesai, wide and racked was das, weird be full a red. Swa quaeth erdstapa, er feather ye mindi, rather a wild slechta, wien a maga, rira. Oft it shall the honor, uchna ye wilcher, mean a carewe quithan, nis nu quickren, excuse me, quick rot nan, the itch him mod saven. Mina dure, swear to la a sedgem. Each to so the wat, that bith in erla, in drift in thel, that he his fairth loken, fast a binder, held a his hoard coven, huge swahi wheeler. Ne my weary mold, weird a wee stondin, ne seth rail, huge helper ye frame up. Let me stop there. So, we just ask for volunteer 
do the first five lines and I'm going to do the first five lines. I won't interrupt you, but then we're going to stop and talk about them. So, Cheryl, you want to go? Because you're lit up on my screen. <laughs> Volunteers? Yeah, sure. I can. I okay. Carlo? So just like the first, first five? Yeah, just the first five. who waits for honor and God for mercy. Uh, though he's anxious of mind across the far seaway, he must stir the ice cold sea with his hands, traveling the paths of exile. Uh, they, first of all, yeah, that's it. Yep. Um, I don't know if everybody heard you. I, on my end, at least, I was getting some breakup or something, but it might be my internet connection. Okay. So before we talk about the translation, not specifically Harlow's, look at the notes, right? And we're told very first thing, oft, which means just often, but in poetry frequently is understatement for always or continually. Notice how that's litotes, often, okay? But Marsden is indicating how often, always often. So it's, it's undercutting that but it's meant to emphasize that it's not just sometimes assault, it's all the time, okay? Him on Haga, on Haga is the solitary one. Okay, so then what's the him doing? Notice it's not nominative case, it's not he. So that's the recipient of the action, okay? So the solitary one, we're gonna come back to the him in a, in a minute, are yabidas. Okay, and you've got a gloss down at the bottom, that same line. Possible meanings of the verb include, yabedeth, include, wait for, endure, experience, and obtain. All right, where'd I put it? I've got it around here somewhere. So I pulled out my Clark Hall dictionary. So, be done means, includes, to stay, to continue, to live, to remain, to delay, to wait for, to await, to expect, to endure, to experience, to find, to attain, to obtain, or to own. Now, I didn't count, the, count those, but that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, three. It's 14 different means, okay? So the solitary one, go jump to the verb. One of those verbs, are, and your gloss tells you, are and milza are her genitive forms after you beat it, and it means grace or mercy. I did not look up. Are in here. Um, Ari has, or just R without the, the clenching, without the ending, means honor, worth, dignity, glory, respect, reverence, grace, favor, prosperity, benefit, help, mercy, pity, and then the other ones are more specific. So take all the meanings for the verbs, take all the meanings for the noun, R, Plug each one of them in and all the different permutations. And notice what that notice what that gives you. It's at least 40. It's well more than that. It's at least a hundred different meanings for just the first one. Okay? But it's awaits, experiences, seeks, lives for, attains, finds him for himself. That's how the hymn works. It's reflexive. So always or continually, the solitary one, 
or the alone one, or the loner, if you want. In fact, one translation titles the poem Loner, okay? Um, does these things, experiences, waits for, expects, grace, favor, mercy, um, prosperity, etc. Okay? But then we get R, R-A, put in a different form. That is, we get what's called variation. That object gets renamed Mitudas Milza. Okay? Mitud means the measurer or creator. So God's mercy. And, and notice, that's much more narrow. Yes, I know my internet connection is... Weak for some reason. I don't know why. Okay? Even though he's... How did you translate mode carry? Anxious of mind, something like that, okay? Because across the ocean, he must, for a long time, he must far go, and he must row with his hands across the ice-cold sea. He must waden. Okay, now your boss tells you waden means travel. Notice he's waden across water. Think modern English. Waden through water. It's like wading. It's, it's modern English verb to wade, right? So he has to wade through the reclastes. Rec is the word from which we get modern English wretched. Okay? It means exile, outcast, okay? And the lastes is the same word that we use to describe, usually in a, when I'm in class and I'm doing this, like for my undergraduates, I take off my shoe and hold it up. Because the form of the sole of a shoe, the shape, it's called the last, L-A-S-T. If you're a cobbler and you make a shoe, you've got a model, you've got a frame that you use to make the last, right? So rat class does, means essentially in the footsteps of the wretched one or the exile, okay? Before we get to the word with full of red, now put the rest of that opening four and a half lines together. So what's the poet saying there? Somebody other than me. Okay. Now, when I said waiting, the reason I, I used waiting is because the modern English comes from wadan, okay? But that means to walk through water. This is wadan rek. He's waiting. He's traveling in the footsteps, but you don't have footsteps in water, right? Because his journey is on the sea. Okay, so he's traveling in a sea journey following the path of exile. Okay, yes, that's, that's exactly what the poet is saying on the surface level. And I like your, how you translated um, Chelsea Yabita, because you used waiting. He's waiting for God's mercy. Okay, so what if we replace that verb? Change it from waiting to one of the other options. Experiencing. How many of you are familiar with Samuel Beckett's great absurdist play, Waiting for Godot? What would it, how would that play be different if it were experiencing Godot? What if Godot showed up? The whole absurdist, you know, basis for the play would be blown out of the water. That's the problem. Godot doesn't show up. Waiting God for God's mercy, as opposed to experiencing God's mercy, does what really to the entire rest of the poem? It changes its entire trajectory. So that's why I said last week, how you translate Yabidith, that one word, 
will determine how you understand the entire rest of the poem. In our problem as 21st century readers, we don't know what the poet intended. Maybe the poet didn't know what the poet intended. I'm not a death of the author kind of person. I think when people write something, they have a pretty good idea of what they intend. Whether or not they get completely what they intend up here, down onto paper, is another, is another discussion. But I think the poet definitely intent, whoever the poet was, definitely intended something by that. And one of the ways we, we can use to try to come at that idea is we got to go back to what I said the first day of class. We've got to try to put our minds, ourselves, into the mind of an Anglo-Saxon individual, somebody living in this time period. So as much as is possible, we've got to try to put all of our modern preconceptions out. Right? And I, sh I should have suggested at the beginning of the semester, and I didn't. I should have suggested getting a copy of C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image, which is a book Lewis wrote to help modern readers better understand medieval literature. It's primarily for later medieval literature, like post 1000 AD, but it also applies to this period, to some extent at least, because what, what Lewis is doing in that book is he's kind of giving you the foundational knowledge of what somebody living 1000 AD would have thought in terms of their everyday life about the world around him or her. What, what he or she would have thought about plants, about animals, about the possibility of there being, you know, um, spirits in the air because they did, you know, believe in that. So when we get to Grindle, it, it shouldn't be as a, as a terrible um, surprise, let's say, that they think there are demons out there. Try to close these blinds a bit. It's not working. Okay, and then we get the kind of the sum, it's, it's not really the summation. I can't think for another word. Um, the coda, let's say, of those first four and a half or first five lines. Weird with full a red. I'm going to pause this for just a second so I can close these blinds. <clears throat> okay, weird with full a red. What's weird? Fate? Um, explain, sir. Uh, I mean, I've always been told it was fate, I guess. Okay. I just kind of ran with it. <laughs> okay. What's fate? Uh, like, oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> Anybody? I couldn't hear everything you said. I don't, again, I don't know if it's my connection or yours, but I just heard a lot of ah, kind of a sound. Sorry. It's not your fault. No, I just said that, no, uh, I just said that fate is like the opposite of like God's, or, or at least of the opposite of free will. So okay. Like okay. Yeah. Destiny, determinism, um, if one is a Calvinist, you probably won't like this, but it's kind of like predestination. Okay. Um, to the, to the Greek mind, let's say, to the ancient Greek mind, you had the gods, let's say over here, humanity's down here. You had the gods over here and you had fate over here, right? So, the gods over here, they could look at fate and they could see what fate had in store for, for humanity. And so they could issue prophecies through the Oracle of Delphi, things like that, you know, Apollo and such. Okay? And they could tell humanity, here's what's going to happen. Well, humanity down here, they can't see fate. They can't see what's going to happen. And so 
look at something like um, Sophocles, Oedipus the king. Oedipus hears the prophecy and he's like, no, I don't want to kill my father and sleep with my mother, you know, you. And so he tries to stop it from happening. And his attempt to stop it from happening is what causes it to happen, okay? So there's, you know, one aspect of the idea of fate is it's going to happen, period, no matter what, okay? The Germanic notion of weird is slightly different, okay? Um, and almost the best way to put it is rather than say it is fated, it's kind of like what will be, will be. Right? I know that doesn't sound much different, but there's a there's a little bit of a little bit of difference there. That is, an individual can in the Germanic system can kind of direct weird a little bit by one's actions. Right? You can you can help to kind of sway fate a little bit, right? So weird bit full red. Weird, and, and in the Germanic sense, what, it's not only this, this idea kind of similar to fate, but it's also this idea of almost a faith or trust or reliance in, in what will be will be or it's, it's almost like what will be should be right it, it's like there's this trust in it right kind of quasi-ish star warsian the force okay so weird bit fool a red weird is fool entire completely now a red, your gloss tells you determined. It also means fixed. Can't be changed. Right? What is weird's, W-Y-R-D, relationship with mitu? With God. It's a, it's a pretty interesting question. I had a student several years ago who did his paper essentially on, you know, the, the Christianization of the idea of weird in Anglo-Saxon poetry. And his point was, you know, when you get God referred to in a lot of these poems, what they're really talking about is the pagan Germanic notion of fate. And they're just kind of dressing it up, you know, in the Christian terminology to make it acceptable to Christians, okay? But when the poet introduces weird here, after the poet has said, Mantuda's milza, God's mercy, well, that seems to have two clashing ideas. That is, they're not intermeshing. They're doing this, okay? Now look what we're told. Swa quath erdstapa. So spoke the erdstapa. Erd earth stapa. Stepa. Ervitha yimindi. Okay. Ervitha of miseries. It's plural. Yimindi. Mindful of. Mind. It's mindy, M-I-N-D hyphen Y, <laughs> full in the mind of, okay? Rathra, wow, slapta. Rathra, genitive plural, of enemies, wow, slapta, slaughters. So it's slaughters of enemies, winna maga, prira, of dear kinsmen. Because the winna maga is, um, Data, um, not data, uh, genitive plural, okay? So he spoke this notice, but what's in his mind? Now, whoever is saying this, these two lines, swap, somebody is saying these two lines. And the person saying this is saying it about the person who said the first five lines, right? 
and the person saying these two lines, which may be the same person, we're told is saying this because this individual, line six and seven, has in his mind what? What's he thinking about? The end of line six and all of line seven. His mind is full of miseries. What miseries? That's what line seven is. Slaughters of enemies and his dear, yeah, his dear kinsman. So what's he thinking about? Death. Okay, which is probably why, go back to line two, which is probably why he is mode carrying. What's mode carry? Your gloss tells you anxious of mind. Mind. Well, what does anxious of mind mean? Why not just say anxious? You know, America's pretty anxious today, right? Big election, everything, you know, hangs in the balance, so, so to speak. A lot of people are mode carrying. So what does it really mean? Is he on edge? Is he like ready to snap? I, I think possibly, okay? And then we get off the itch. Who's the itch? Who's the I? Is it the person saying, so said the earth stepper, the wanderer, or is it the person saying, oft him amhada? And do we now have a third speaker? Okay, so somebody translate, um, The next three and a half lines, oft it shall do through line 11a, swear to the ascension. You better jump, it's only three and a half lines. Yeah, I can, uh, let's see, see. I can, uh, let's see, see. Yeah, I don't know. Line eight, eight to eleven a. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna go off the wall. Work for word at the moment. That's fine. Uh, always, I have had uh, two alone at each dawn. My sorrow, my sorrow lament. There is not one living to whom uh, my heart there plainly expressed. Okay. That's good. You can stop there. So, notice, what's the speaker say? And, and we've got in that line 9b, we've got a now, okay? So, often I should have had to alone, utna yichwilicha, mina kara quila. Okay? How did you translate that, Carla? Uh, which line is that? Um, 8b through 9a. Okay. There's not, there's not one living to whom uh, my heart, my heart to plainly express. Okay. So he had to lament by himself at dawn. Why at dawn? It's when he wakes up. He wakes up and what does he say? Forced by necessity, essentially, he's alone and he has to lament what's going on in his heart. There is not now none, okay, the new is important. Now there is not anyone, he says, to whom he dare plainly express the feelings of his heart. Why? Because itch shelled anna, oft him on haga. Because the speaker is alone. Who's he going to speak to? Okay. So, Somebody pick up 11b, itch to sow the what, and go to the end of 16. Somebody okay. other than her. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, I have to truth know that it is a man of excellent virtue that he is uh, heart binds fast, keeps close his treasure chamber, uh, keeps close his, or thinks his thoughts as he will. Uh, 
your camp is very hard, they can resist you have trouble with my uh, help. Okay, good. You can stop there. And, and let me just suggest for whoever translates, do it word for word rather than a polish. That way it's easier for me to follow and to stop and such. So, each to so the what? How did you translate that, Sarah? Yeah. So I as a truth know. Okay. It's I know in truth. I know this to be true is what he's saying. Right? Not fact. He's not saying this is a fact. He's saying, I know this, this is a, you know, like an unalienable right. It is an a priori statement of truth. Okay. What is the statement of truth? That bith in erla in drikna fell. It is an excellent virtue in, an, in a man, an arrow, that he his faith loken, his heart, faster binda. Then he do what to his heart? Lock it up. Keeps it close. Okay? Holds, rules, if you want, is another word for halda. It doesn't just mean, you know, keep close. It means holds, controls. His hoard Coven. Hoard, like treasure hoard, it's the same word. Coven, coffer. It's the coffer of where everything that is important is. That's in his heart. Okay? Hitchaswahewila. Think as he wishes. Think as he desires. Notice there's kind of a, a two seemingly or somewhat contradictory notions here. Thinking and feeling, thinking and expressing. So he can think what he wants, but what must he do with what he thinks? Exactly. Keep it locked up. Don't express it, right? When I, when I talk about taking 21st century, the 21st century mindset and preconception, you know, and setting them aside, that's necessary. Because what does our 21st century, 21st century mindset say? Express yourself, you know, get it off your chest. Well, it's just the opposite here. And notice this is for what? This is an excellent virtue. Okay. This is the practice that should be followed, the speaker says, to keep it all locked up. Not may weary mind, okay, weird, fate, what will be will be, case or asara, you know, all those kinds of things, with standen. That word with standen, you got to bear in mind, with W I Thorn or Ev in Anglo Saxon doesn't mean modern English with. Modern English with means like alongside. With in Anglo Saxon means opposed to. So to withstand something, modern English, it still has its old English meaning, right? Because if you withstand something, you're standing against that. So what's he saying about the Notice, weary mind. It can't do what? It can't oppose fate. Jump to Hamlet. Okay. Act three, the famous to be or not to be soliloquy. What's he talking about? Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or with a bare bodkin, you know, Okay. That's in the mind, supposedly, because supposedly that's a soliloquy. Not a soliloquy because there's somebody literally on the stage at the time when he says that. Ophelia is on the stage, right? So he says, the weary mind, the tired mind, the mind that is mold carry, right? The mind that is remembering, recalling the death of kinsmen, the death of enemies, etc. 
can't fight against fate. Right? Nor net sahrail hija help your friend. Nor the tr troubled mind. Okay, I see where he gets troubled from Hrael. Anybody know what the modern derivative of Hrael is? Raw. R-A-W. So how can a mind be raw? What is raw meat as an example? It's exposed, right? This is like saying the exposed mind, exposed to all the elements. What do the elements do? They beat down upon it. This is a mind that has been so beaten down by experience that it, help you frame it, it cannot give help. <clears throat> it cannot give help to the person who's weary in mind. Well, how can the person who's weary in mind look to the mind for more help? Have you ever known somebody who, or maybe you yourself, don't answer it if you haven't, uh, has been severely depressed? And I don't mean, you know, down in the dumps. I mean suicidal depressed. They can't see the help themselves, right? Help has to come from outside. Where's the outside for this guy? There is none. Why not? He's all alone. I mean, I, I once had a, a student in this class. He was a um, former military, former special forces. Um, we got to this poem. I did this poem earlier, a little bit earlier in the semester. We got to this poem and he dropped. I mean, he literally dropped the class. And I got this, you know, brief email, and he said, started translating it, and it just triggered all my PTSD. For the simple reason he expressed in so many words, I was the one. Because he had been on a mission, and all of his buddies got killed. And he was the only one left. And he said, it's, it's, it's too raw. He explained, you know, the raw mind, I know exactly what he's talking about, okay? So, someone pick up with uh, 20, 19, 18, 17, and go to, I want to find a good place to stop. Because that's all one idea. Go to 26, 7, 8. Go to 29A, Wayman Midwinning. Who said I'll do it? Lady, who said that? Chelsea said it. Yeah, do the word for word, please. Okay. He knows he uh, go ahead and stop there with the uh, entice me with pleasures. So, notice for the first time, I believe, in the poem, we get a forethon. Okay? And forethon is used several times in the poem. Sometimes it means therefore, sometimes it means because, sometimes it means something else. But it's, it's a phrase that's used repeatedly. So, Therefore, he says, Dom Yerona, those eager for glory, 
or renown. Dome means judgment. Okay, the air not means eager. So eager for, but but not judgment like a judicial proceeding. Judgment like the judgment of succeeding ages. Fame is what he's talking about. Those eager for fame. Okay, often the dreorina, dreorina. Modern English word is what? Dreary. They are dreary in what? In their breast coven, in their breast coven, their heart, bind fast. Okay. So they lock again. Those eager for glory who are dreary in mind, they lock their heart up fast. So notice what they don't do. They don't complain. They don't whine and mope and all that kind of stuff, okay? So I, my mode seven, okay, had to often arm carry, and there we get that carry again, okay? Care worn, evil be dallied. What does evle mean? Homely. And he's bedallied of his homeland. What does that mean? The gloss tells you deprived of. Okay. The dal there, it's the same word as in modern English deal, like to deal out cards. What are you doing? You're parting. So he is parted from his homeland. So now we get another Another bit of the, the, let's say, psychological makeup, if you want, of the speaker. We've already heard what about his kin. We heard it in the first several lines. They're dead. Okay? He's got problems. And what are, we going to be, what are we going to hear in just about two lines after this? He had to bury whom? Is it his best friend? His, his Lord. Remember that, that fourfold Germanic ethic of C.L. Wren? Duty to one's Lord, duty to one's kin, duty to avenge one's Lord or kin, and trust in weird? Okay. Uh, what happened to his duty to avenge his Lord? Some people read this and say, well, here, this is why he's a wanderer. He's been exiled because he didn't defend his Lord in battle. There's nothing in the poem that suggests that. What the poem does suggest, if anything, that this guy's the last surviving member of his tribe. Everybody else has been wiped out. And one aspect of the Germanic mentality is, you know, if your Lord dies, you should die with him. Now, it doesn't mean you kill yourself, or it doesn't mean, you know, uh, if you're going to win the battle, you still have to kill yourself after you win. It, it's okay to survive, but, you know, if your Lord's going to die and your people are going to die, it's really better to go down with your Lord. And that's one of the values of reading the Battle of Malden. Because in the Battle of Malden, they all die. And they all die surrounding their Lord's hacked up body. Okay? So, that's why he says, Freo magum fair, far from his noble kin, okay, fetterum salad, bound with fetters. Is he literally, does he have manacles on his hands? Seven yar are you because a long time ago. Yara you is kind of like once upon a time. So how long has this guy been wandering? Long time. If he's been wandering a long time, what else does that mean? He's been alone a long time. He's been out without human companionship for a long time. Okay. Have any of you ever read Samuel Johnson's Rasalus or the Prince of Abyssinia? It's a great little poem, short story kind of a thing. One of the things in there is there's a character who talks about what happens to the mind when the mind turns on itself. Because the mind doesn't have anything out there to focus on, okay? 
the mind focus in, focuses inwardly. And what it does is it eats itself. The person will go crazy, right? So he's been without his Lord for a long time. And so he had to bury him, bruise in Helstra Bera, okay? And each hand thrown in woad went to carry. And I dejected Han, okay, from thence, or hence, he went thence, woad, woad. What does woad mean? Crazy. Well, it does later. Here, this is past tense for went, okay? Winter carry. Now, we're not winter carry yet because it's still November and it's not that cold. But put yourself in England, middle of February, 800 AD. No central heat in the air. You probably live in a mud and waddle hut. Or if you're part of a, a troop of warriors who have a lord, you live in a hall, but he's not part of a troop of warriors, and he doesn't have a lord, and he's been spending his time where? On the ice-cold sea. And he's been rowing across the ice-cold sea how? With his hands. The bound with fetters is probably ice, like ice in the bottom of his boat, because it's a small boat. If you can row with your hands on either side of the boat, what's your boat called? It's like a canoe or a kayak, okay? He sought what? Line 25. Sela Dreri. He wants a new Lord. Because he's Sela Dreri. He's dreary of hall. Why dreary? Because he doesn't have one. He's sad of hall. He needs a hall. Why? Because the hall, protection. protection, what else? What else does the hall represent? Stability. Stability. Think of, a, think of what a symbol is. See, we have this modern idea that, that a symbol is just something that stands for something else. It has no real connection to that other thing. Up through the Middle Ages, symbols were the thing themselves and there is a logical connection, connection between the thing and what it represents. The hall represents stability. How so? Because it's big and it's firm and it's made out of solid timber and packed earth. Okay? It's not easy to knock down. Right? What else does the hall represent? Who sits literally in the center of the hall? The king or lord. What does the king or lord do in the center of the hall? Gives out gold, dispenses justice. So the hall for the tribe or for the clan or for the kingdom, the king's hall, is the center. What you know, extrapolate to the modern day. What is the hall? It's the capital of the country. And if you wanted to, you know, the hall in the United States, kind of interesting that we have one. Britain has its own. It's the White House. In Britain, it's number 10 Downing Street. Okay. So he seeks out one of those because he wants everything that the hall includes. And we didn't include, we didn't discuss one of the greatest things the hall includes. Peace. Merriment, laughter, song. You know, when B, uh, excuse me, when Cadman gets up and leaves, he leaves the hall. That's where the ale is coming around. That's where the harp is coming around. It's where there's song, there's laughter, etc. He leaves the hall. He seeks out a new giver of treasure. Where I, whether far or near, that is, he's been searching far away, as well as near away, could find what? What specifically, what kind of treasure friend is he looking for? Someone who could frevron wode. 
give him comfort, give him solace. Wayman mid winning. Okay. Pleasures. Excuse me. To to bring me in to entice me with women, with pleasures, with joys, with revels. Right. Now, we're not going to necessarily do it, but you could go straight from this point, and you could go to the end of the poem. You could go to the very last line of the poem and, and be able to show, I think, that very last line of the poem, it's not an interpolation. It's distinctly linked to what the poet is saying right here. What's he really looking for? And I think it was either Sarah or Chelsea said it in connection with what the hall provides. Stability. This guy wants what? Permanence. He's tired of the vagaries of weird, of, of seemingly stuff coming at him from every side, right? So somebody pick up with, and I'll read some first, um, 29B, I think it is. And you're going to go to, oh, yeah, we have to stop there. Um, the end of 36b. So let me read some. What, saith the Kunath, who slith and myth, sorg to yeferon, thumb to him lit haveth, levra yeholen, wireth he no reckless, nalas wounden bold, firth look of frary, nalas folden bled, yamon he selesegis on sinktheia, who hina on yerguta, his gold wina, wainada to wista. Win el address. So somebody pick up with what saith they kunos. Okay, sure. Sorry, Elizabeth. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> um, you go ahead. He, knows he that tries that how cruel its grief is companion for him that few had dear comrades. Preoccupies the path of exile, not fulfilled, spirit enclosure frozen, not at all earth's splendor. Remembers the hall men and treasure receiving, how him and his youth, his gold friend, entertained with feast, delight all perish. Okay, stop there. So, notice what said the kunas. And translate that again, Cheryl. What said the kunas? Knows he that tries it. Okay. Knows he that tries it, or knows he who understands it could be, or knows he who has experienced it, or he knows who has experienced this. What kind of phrase does that introduce, or what kind of um, poetic or literary kind of genre or thing? Is that an example of? It's a proverb. This is what's called a gnomic passage. G-N-O-M-I-C. It's a wisdom passage. It's, you know, he who knows what I'm talking about, he who has experienced it will know what I am talking about. So if you haven't experienced it, you can't really understand it, the speaker is saying. Okay? And what is it he's saying you have to have experience, you have to know? Line 30, how? How what? How cruel is grief as a companion? Right? How many of you like having grief as a companion? Probably not many. Come tomorrow, next week, whenever it finally ends, you know, half the country is going to have grief as a companion, right? Because half the country is not going to like whatever the, the results are, okay? Thumb think him lit haveth. For him, who what? Has few dear comrades. So that's why he says, Wareth hina reckless. What preoccupies the exile. 
That's what preoccupies his mind. That he's all alone. He doesn't have any friends. Not gold. Wounded gold refers to wound up, coiled gold. And it's not coiled in some weird... He's talking about gold arm rings, like a bangle. Okay? Thin strip of gold or thin wires of gold that have been braided together that can be opened and closed and put on the arm. The more rings one had, that was an indicator of how worthy one was as a warrior. Because your king, your gold friend, would distribute treasure accordingly, right? Firth loca frere, malus folden bled. Not at all Earth's splendor. Okay. So, for the person who's all alone, who doesn't have any friends, who doesn't have a lord, who doesn't have a house, gold intellectually doesn't provide you anything because it doesn't buy you friends, right? How many of you have read the late medieval play allegory, Every Man? Well, what is it every man can bring with him to death? Good deeds. Gold's not going to stick with them. Friends aren't going to stick with them. Family's not going to stick with them. But his good deeds, meaning his virtues, those will stick with him. So not gold, not the splendors, treasures of the earth, so to speak. Okay. And what does he remember? Notice the subject. Hey, hey, Yaman, he remembers Selesegis, Paul, men, and Sink. Thea, sink is treasure, Thea is receiving. He remembers retainers in the hall. How to him, for him, in youth, how when he, okay, so if he remembers, we're being told in his youth, what does that say about him now? He's old. Thank you. Why is this important? He's looking back on a long time ago. Yes. Go ahead, Lainey. I, I was going to say this happened a long time ago. Okay. Or he's, think, yeah, or he's thinking about it. It's interesting that the Wanderer Poet says this because we're going to see Beowulf will say, you know, when I was a youth, in, in, in so many critics, and you read a lot of stuff, and it sounds like they think Beowulf is young. For example, when he goes to Hrothgar's kingdom to defeat Grindel. I don't think he is. I think Beowulf's pretty old, in fact. Okay? Or at the very least, he's probably in his 40s, if not older than that. And I think he actually is older than that. And we'll see why, um, assume when we get there. Okay? So, he remembers that, how he and youth, his gold friend, what? Wenida Towista, entertained at feast. His gold friend's his lord. So he's thinking back. In what? When El Yadras. Joy. Notice, notice this half of the line. It's simple, it's short, it's declarative. Joy, L, all entirely, completely, fully perished. It's gone. Okay. Fourth on. Fourth on what say Feshel, his winadrickness, lay of us lark weed and longer for the name. Thona sorg and slop, so mod at Gadra. Thinketh him on moda, thought he his mondrichten, clipper and kissa, on a kneo leja honda and hervat. Swa he quilum er in yardagum, ye bestolus brack. They will stop there. Somebody translate those lines. You can do it. Okay. Okay. Therefore, 
is from the Lord's dear precepts for a long time ago. In sorrow and sleep together at the same time, wretched, solitary, often held fast. It seems to him a thought that he is Lord of graces and kisses and on his knee, but to head in the hand and head, just as he did before in days of old, and enjoys the gift room. We keep going? No, stop there. Okay. So what's that an image of? Very close relationship. Very close relationship. What else? Okay, Lord, Lord thing relationship, and you get that, you know, Wiener Drickness, his friendly Lord, okay? Um, what else? Why the hand and head on the Lord's knee? What's that an image of? What? I didn't hear it. It almost seems like an oath, like... I don't know why, but that harkens back to me in the image of the Bible. With um, if you're swearing an oath, place your hand under my thigh. It just it, it seems like an image of loyalty. It you're really close, Bethany. You're really close. It's an image. It, it's an image that can can have two meanings. One is blessing. Okay, for example, when who is it? Joseph brings to Jacob his two sons just before Jacob's death, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, you know, Jacob does this. He crosses his hands over. And Joseph's like, no, 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 you got that wrong. He's like, no, I don't, son. So, okay. They put their hands on Jacob's knees. Okay. That's one image. So there's a biblical illusion possibly there. And the other one is a classical notion in that this is a means of seeking Grace or forgiveness or mercy. In, in classical lit, you see it in the Aeneid. Um, you see it in the Odyssey. Uh, I think you see it in the Iliad, but I don't remember, so I can't say for sure. You have characters who come up to somebody else, and they clasp them around the legs, behind the legs like this, and they put their heads on their knee. And when they do that, they're seeking mercy. In the Neid, famous image of it, person does this, and the person whose mercy is sought just takes the sword and, you know, right down through the neck. I mean, no mercy granted there, okay? So where is all this happening? Think of him on the moga. He thinks in his mind. Is it a dream? See, that's... Is because the next line says he made that he makes that for you. So on unwetness, okay, so could be a dream. Or can you awaken from a daydream? Yeah. I mean, come on, how many of us have been in class before? Wow, 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 you know, professor joining on and you're looking out the window and it's snowing or something else or you know, Zoom class and you've got all this, right? Um, so he thinks all this, and he thinks of days of old enjoyed. Thona onwek nath eft, when Elias guma, yeseeth him before on thalwe vegas, bathi and brimfuglas, brad and fethra, prayer son krim on sna, pagla ye mengen, thona beoth ti ye Hefigren Hertenbena. That's my place. Sora after Swazna. Sorg bith yenuid. Stona maga yemin mod yond horvath. We'll stop there. So somebody pick up with Thona on Wetneth eft. Okay. Then a week again, the friendless man and sees before him dusty waves, seabirds banning, spreading feathers, snow and frost fallen with hail mingled. Then be the more grievous heart, then, then be the more grievous his heart's wounds and longing for the beloved one. Sorrow is renewed after the memory of kin uh, pervades the mind. Okay, so he wakes up. And he sees before him these images. 
what are the images? What what does he literally see? He sees he comes back to awareness of his surroundings. He sees the waves and the birds and how he's all alone. Okay. It's kind of snapped back to the horrible grim reality that he's in. Snow and hail is falling. Okay. Uh, great earth blue, uh, great earth blue yarna yarn shalleth, sedja ye seldom, swimmeth oft on way, flea tendra, flea tendra ferth, no ther fela bringeth, kudra quida yeda, carol bith ye newid, thumb the sinden shall, swither ye neha, over wild among ye been. Where in a seva? Somebody want to pick up and do those lines? So what's doing the greeting? The greatest. It's, it's present tense. It's third person. Okay. Greets eagerly or joyfully. What? Who's speaking? Who said that? Oh, okay. Because your screen didn't light up. And that's why it's curious. Um, okay, keep going. I'm Okay, what in the world is happening in these lines? Who's doing the swimmeth off? Okay, but he calls them his companions. See, this this passage has been written about an awful lot because there's concern. You know, is he hallucinating? I mean, great with glue stab him here in the Yan Shaweth, Sedja Yeselden, okay, companions of men, swimmeth oft on way, you got a gloss down on the bottom, often they float away. Flea tendra fair, no their fela bringeth, kudra, quida yeda, etc. Okay, you've got, you know, the floating ones or swimmers are the seabirds who, in the return to reality, replace the dream of loved ones. Glossing those lines, the spirit of the floating ones does not bring their many spoken utterances. Why not? <coughs> because they're birds. Okay. So he sees the birds, apparently, in what does the solitary one, the wanderer, think he sees? Temporarily, at least. His, his, his dead friends. And then they do what? They float away. And he's left all alone again. Fourth on, itch ye thinking. Nemai ye anthos world for Juan Modseva, me ne ye swerka, thona itch erla leaf eol ye anthinka, who he fairly che flit of ye avan, modia maguthenas. Therefore, what I think, I consider, I, you could say, I think even believe, what? Anybody? I think. Okay, keep going. I therefore I think not may or one may not what? I have therefore I think 
cannot in this world while my mind has become dark when I think of all the lawyers, etc., etc. It's really weird when you Okay, so what's he getting at? Look at it again. Forth on itch you think in night my I am not able to think throughout this world for Juan. You got a gloss. For what or why? Why the mind, my mind, mean ne yeswerka should not grow dark. Thona itch. Yeah. Why? I, I don't think, I am unable to think why my mind should not grow dark. When? When it erla leaf eorli think of. When I think about fully this life of men in this world. Okay? How he, they, fairly, Jay, quickly flit off the oven. Flit off the oven is an Anglo Saxon euphemism. How they Leave the floor. But what's meant by leave the floor? Die. Yeah, die. Pass away. Reposed in the Lord. Kick the bucket, you know. Modja maguthanos. Brave young men. So what makes him think, you know, life sucks, man. Because that's what that uh, 58 through 60 really means. What makes him think that I can't consider or I can't even allow that one should not think darkly about all of life in this world when he thinks of what? Young warriors dying. Now that's pretty powerful stuff, because this is written when? It, it, as far as we know, if, even if it's written around 1000 AD, Anglo-Saxon society is still what? It's still a warrior society. I mean, war, is, war soldiers being a, you wouldn't have knights, but being a thing, that's not something looked down, down on. I mean, this isn't like um, Vietnam, soldiers returning in the late 60s through the early to mid 70s i mean spat upon in airports this is when you know warriors were held up in honor like when soldiers returned from you know iraq and afghanistan etc cetera, etc cetera. people would applaud in airports and such he's saying what makes him think man life sucks and there's no real meaning to life is when he thinks of what Young men dying. That's what he's getting at. Swa says men yard without without even turning the page. Thus or so, this world or this Middle Earth, if you want. Elra dogra yehuam dresseth and faileth. What does that line mean? If it's not clear by now. I love this poem. This poem just speaks to me on so many levels, right? Because it's very existential in one sense. I mean, it's, it's like it's written by a 1970s existential, you know, philosopher almost. But Alra Dogra Yahuam Drezeth and Fadeth. I have each and every day here, I just lost my place. Um, declines and falls. Yeah. And what's doing the declining and falling? What was on the previous page. Thus this middle earth each and every day declines and falls. And if you take that to its logical conclusion, so if it's each and every day, so if, it, if today declines and falls, and what about tomorrow? Tomorrow's going to be worse day than, than today. And the day after tomorrow, it's going to be worse than tomorrow. And there's, there's this aspect of me that's like, oh, man, he's got it so right. I mean, that just describes life. Right? Fourth on. Notice, I mean, just the repetitive fourth on. It's therefore, therefore, therefore. It's like he's making a logical argument. 
Okay. Fourth on Nimai where on Wies where er he aya Wintradel in world reacher. We to shall ye did the ne shall know to hath hot held, ne to hrad weird, ne to walk weed, ne to one heedy, ne to fork, ne to fine, ne to fail ye, ne never yelp us to yearn, er he yarakula. Okay? So somebody translate those lines. Okay. Sorry, do you stop at 69? I stopped at the end of 69. Okay. Therefore, what can become lost as man does as it occurs in the kingdom of the world? A wise man should be patient, not should too fiery, nor too hasty of speech, nor too weak warrior, nor too reckless nor too fearful, nor too joyful, nor too well greedy, nor never boasting too eager for before he clearly knows. Okay. Why, why therefore, after the previous sentence about, you know, all this world declines and drops away every day, why do we get this therefore Go ahead. People aren't working long enough to make the world better. They're all dying too young, and none of them are wise. Okay. Or, and they're all too boastful before they get a chance to become better. And, and notice what he says in that opening line and a half here. Therefore, one may not become wise, erhe agga. And the aga means owns, possesses, lives. Wintra dal in Walrije. Unless he owns, possesses, what's Wintra dal? Unless he's lived a long life. That's what that means. You cannot be wise until you've lived a long life in this world. But what have we just been told about this world? It declines and falls every day. In other words, until you've experienced and lived through Hamlet's slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, unless you've taken the knocks that life has to live. Very, very similar to what Sophocles says in Oedipus the King and in Antigone. Okay? And then he gives us this kind of, again, gnomic passage. Therefore, you shouldn't be too, what? You shouldn't be too hasty of speech. You should be patient. You shouldn't be a weak warrior. You shouldn't be reckless in thought. You shouldn't be too fearful, nor too joyful, nor too greedy, nor too boasting. Before you know what? What's the erhe yarakuna really mean? You shouldn't be too boastful about, you know, military deeds before you know what? Can you fulfill them? No. Yeah. Yeah. Until you know what you're up against. Right? He's saying, don't pop. Think of a presidential election. What do presidential candidates take Trump and Biden out and, and go backwards or forwards in time? What, do, what does every presidential candidate do? I'm going to what? They boast. I'm going to use the language. I'm going to make your life better. I'm going to give you, you know, back in the 1950s, two cars, two chickens in the pot, you know, the whole night. I'm going to lower your taxes. I'm going to raise your taxes. I'm going to give you jobs. I'm going to blah, 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 blah. Boast, 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 boast. All on the basis of what? Do they know how they're going to do that necessarily? Usually not. Because usually, then they get elected and what do they discover? Oh my God, you're kidding. The budget's really this bad? I can't, you know, okay? That's what the poet's getting at. You shouldn't boast until you know how you're going to 
do what it is you're supposed to of, right? We'll see the same thing apply in Beowulf. Beowulf comes in and goes, Grendel Schmendel, I'll kick his, you know, and Unferth is like, come on, man. We've heard stories about you. You couldn't even win a simple swimming match. And what does Beowulf do? Oh, you haven't heard the whole story of the swimming match. You mean the one against Brecca? The one where I beat off nine sea monsters and swam 500 miles fully armed. You mean that swimming match? Grendel Schmindel. Mm -hmm. So the speaker goes on. Line 70. Um, let's see here. I'm taking longer than I expected. Um, somebody translate from line 70, Baron shall you be done, to, oh, I don't want to stop there. To, no, that's too, let's go a little bit more. Um, yeah, that's a good place. To the end of 84, so 14 lines. Courageous translators, what is needed? Somebody who hasn't translated, or has everybody already? Elizabeth, have you translated yet? Okay. No volunteers? I can go on. So from like 72, did he say 84? Yeah, end of 84. Okay. Uh, until start out, stout hearted, no thoroughly wear of his heart, not to to turn will realize most prudent realize most prudent man how awful that is when all of this world's riches desolate stands uh so now in various places throughout this world wind blown on wall stand frost covered uh snow beaten uh snow beaten the buildings crumbled uh, the wine crumbled the wine halls rulers lie dead Joy deprived of the uh, noble company, all fell proud near the wall. Some war destroyed, carried on, carried on the onwards path. One bird bore, bore away, always uh, deep ocean. One the gray wolf shared in death. One sat faced in earth grave. One buried. Okay, we're going to talk about all of it, but the very last line and a half. Okay, soon the dreyer, dreyer ich lor in earth shafa arrow yehida. Well, what did the speaker already tell us he did for his wiener drifted or his gold wiener, his gold boy? He, he buried him in an earth hall, and that's just what this speaker said. One dreyer uh, leor sad faced in earth shrafa in an earthen hall a grave arrow lord or man if you want you hid it bury and he concludes that list of things with that image okay now let's go back so the warrior should wait before he utters a boast until start out at Baba. he knows which way his thoughts going to turn that is, is he going to see the monster and go, run away, run away? Or is he, you know. Um, on your tongue, line 73, shall glel hala, on your tongue, realize, perceive, understand, know, the prudent man, what, how, and I understand why he uses the word awful, but he's using the word awful in its very modern sense, as in horrible. I'm old fashioned. I prefer, you know, using the words with their original meanings. Awful means full of all. Gastelich, in its modern sense, its modern spelling is what? Ghastly. That's what's meant there. How Ghastly is all this world's riches, or when all this world's riches, Westa standeth, stand waste. 
skin, waste. So think of all this world's riches. He doesn't mean simple money. He means things like towns and buildings. So imagine New York City, totally empty. Go back to all those great, you guys are all too young to watch, uh, to remember them when they came out. All those great 1970s apocalyptic movies, right? Many of them set in places like New York, where the buildings are there for the most part, but all the people are dead, right? Swanu Misinlich, how in various places throughout this Middle Earth, wind does what? Blows against the walls that are standing covered with frost. Well, why are the walls standing covered with frost? What's, what's the implication? The walls are cold, right? It's not just that the walls are covered with frost because it's snow and it's cold and snowing outside. It's because there's no heat being generated inside. The halls are empty. The people are all dead. The halls are all that remain, right? The Duguth, okay, the hall rulers, you know, lie dead, etc. The Duguth, all Yakron, fell. The Duguth, your gloss tells you the noble company. You often see opposed in Old English, the Duguth and the Yoguth. The Duguth is the, or are the, Old, grizzled, battle-hardened warriors. These are the ones who fought many battles and lived through. The Yogatha are the young, untrained warriors. These are the guys who are just itching to get out there and fight because they don't know what war is like. Okay? And we're told here, the old guys fell by the wall. That is, defending it. Some war destroyed okay but notice what ultimately is happening to all of them they're all dying some die by war some um were destroyed in war one was carried away a bird bore one away these are the images of the beasts of death the eagle the raven and the wolf etc one the wolf carried away and then one, we get the conclusion. One was buried in the earth. In the swathisna air yard, out of the shipping, oh, that bird water, breached my leaza, out into your work, idlu stodem. Idde, laid waste. Thus, this air yard, this, your gloss tells you, habitation. This town, this city, this home, out of the shipping. Man's creator. What's the what's the subject? God. God did what? God destroyed this habitation. But what's this habitation really? It's man's habitation. It's the world. It's not a specific locale. It's the whole world. Of that, Bergwara of citizens, Breachmaleza, okay, loosed, deprived of, joys, revelries, al inta ye work, the old work of giants. Okay, what the hell is the old work of giants? Well, the Anglo-Saxons apparently thought, for example, or at least they mythologically did, if they didn't literally, places like the town of Bath were the work of giants. Why? Anglo-Saxons built only in timber. The Germanic tribes built only in timber. We have written accounts of Germanic people showing up in London, uh, not London, showing up in Rome and having their minds blown away by seeing the Forum and the Colosseum. They're like, how could human, no, no, no. Well, in England, when the Anglo-Saxons got there and they saw the remains of 
Roman towns, Roman villas. We've got multiple works that talk about the into your work, the work of giants. Look at something like Stone Age. I don't know if you've ever been to Salisbury Plain. Go to Stone Age and, and kind of go, okay, imagine yourself a thousand years ago and you're thinking, it's a mighty big rock sitting on top of those other two rocks. How'd they get those up there? When you don't have a knowledge of blocks and tackles, leverage, you know, fulcrums, etc. Okay? Sorry, sorry, the old work of giants, Idlu Stogen. I don't like his translation for Idlu. He translates it as empty. What word do we get from that word today? Replace the final vowel with an E. Idle. These old works of giants stood idle. What, what is your car doing when you're at a red light and you're sitting there and your engine's running? It's idling, right? But what's the car not doing? What is the purpose of an automobile? To go. <laughs> it's not to stand idle. The purpose of this habitation of men is for what? for men and women to be in. And the implication is it's going to stand idle, not for its purpose. It's not only empty. It won't be fulfilling what it is designed for. Fair oft yaman while slat the warn on fast ward aqueef. Somebody want to translate those? Just those four lines, three lines, four lines. Okay. Okay. So, notice, the person who does what? Deeply considers these things. What do you mean by that? Just, uh, I, I took it as uh, considering the consequences. Well, it gives it, uh, the previous section is basically a warning to serve these stoic and not to be too bold or too weak, and then this is seeing the destruction of, you know, of these sort of monolithic buildings that are well, of people that you'd assume are stronger than you, and seeing that they have also that something they consider stronger has been laid to waste. Yep. Yep. This is, I mean, this is one of the reasons Tolkien famously said in that essay on Beowulf that all of Anglo Saxon literature is about one thing the death of man and all his works. I mean, it, it really comes out in here. But the poet saying, you know, you've got to really think about this to see this, to understand this happening. And so this is the word that the person who deeply considers the reality of human existence will say, okay? And when it says, you know, and this word says, Word doesn't just mean, you know, like single individual word. It means this saying, this proverb, this wisdom. Where qual mag? This, this, these are the most famous lines in this poem. Where qual mago? Where qual madriva? Where qual simbla yisertu? Where senden sela dramas? Eala bert buna? Eala birnwiga? Eala thednes thrim? Who seo throg yawat? You're not underneath him. Swa hell no wara standeth new and lasta leavra dugatha while wundrum hell worm leeching fall. Where, 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 where? It's called the Ubisunt motif. Ubisunt is where are in Latin. Peter, Paul, and Mary in the late 1960s had a famous 
anti-war, anti-Vietnam song. Where have all the flowers gone? Flowers were symbols of the, the young men sent off to war, okay? Where quam mer? What's mer? The horse. Where's the horse? Where quam mago? Kinsman. Where quam madum yiva? Treasure giver. Madum is treasure, giva giver, okay? Where quam simla yisietu? Hall pleasures. Where quam hall pleasures is celadrimus. Simla you said to the seats of the banquet. So, what has happened to the horse? What has happened to the kinsman? What has happened to the treasure giver? What has happened to the treasure hall, the place where the treasures are given? What has happened to the hall treasures or pleasures? Eala bert buna. Eala. That's like a lance. The bright warrior or the mailed warrior. The Ayala Birnu is the male warrior. Ayala Thedness Thrym, the prince's Thrym, his glory, his majesty. Who sail Thragulak? How has time gone by? Yanap under Michtum. How it grew dark under the cover of night. How dark has it grown under the cover of night? Swa hell. No, where? As if it never was. Now, the as if it never was, what does that really get at? The Lord, the horse, the kinsman, the hall, the hall pleasures. They are as if they never were. What is one thing, even today, most people want to feel will happen, let's say, after their death about them. Do like it has the importance of being remembered. Yes, it's exactly it. Watch the recent Disney film, Coco. It's it's beautiful. My mom died of Alzheimer's. My dad has Alzheimer's of of some kind or another, you know, and that film is a wonderful metaphor for what happens with Alzheimer's because an Alzheimer's patient stops to forget who people are, who their children are, okay? And it's as if you don't exist to that person anymore. This person is saying, when you really stop to think about all this stuff deeply, and some would say, morbidly and pessimistically, it's as if none of those previous joys ever existed at all, right? There's kind of a modern, well, relatively modern, 500 years ago, update on this in Shakespeare's, when I to the sessions of sweet silent thought, think of thee. Read that sonnet, sonnet 30, I believe, because it's, it's kind of interesting because he does some of the same things, right? So, um, standeth nu on last the lever do with a well winter. So he, you know, stands now at last the dear do with the noble retainers. Well, rindum hell, wirm licum fa, and the snake patterns adorn. The implication is almost like the, you can see here and in the lines that follow. The bones of the dead warrior sticking out of, out of snow. Here, here they are. You know, because the question was, where are they? Where is the bright mailed warrior? Oh, there's part of them. Look, there's a femur sticking out of the ground. Air loss for Nomen, line 99. Um, Oscar three of them. Wap and waddle you through. Weird sail marrow. On Fastan Hleothu, Stormas Knisaf, Hrith Hreo Senda, Bruz on Bindath, Wintress Woma, Thona Wan Kimeth Nippeth Nishua, excuse me, North on Unsenda, Hreo Halfar, Halathum on Andam. Somebody want to translate those lines? 
99 to the end of 105? Can. All right. So go back to 99. <clears throat> so Erinos Pornaman, men carried off Asha Thritha, hosts of ash spears. Notice men are killing other men. Weapons while you Notice what is being said about the weapons. They are slaughter greedy. Not the men, the weapons, okay? Weird sell Mara. Weird the renown. Mara can mean renowned, can mean glorious, can mean great, okay? So I thought it was the men that did it. But now we get weird. <laughs> and it's almost like the air loss is being replaced with weird, okay? Where the throw and the snow falls, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the men die and are covered. Top of 382. Al is erfolt leech, erdan reche. Somebody translate just that line. Oh, hardship, All is full of hardship, Earth's kingdom. Life is hard. Or as one of the characters in one of my favorite films says, life is pain. Minus Princess Bride. Okay. On windeth weird yeshef world under under heaven. What's the subject in that line? On windeth say it again. Distribution of the fates or the shaping of fate, because yeshaft is related to that word for shape, okay, does what? Changes on windeth. To wind means to, to wind, like on a journey. You're making your way, but you don't have a point A, point B, and it's a straight shot, okay? Weird changes or shapes the changes of the world under heaven. Why is it weird? <laughs> or of the fates. Why, why is it weird and not metude? Metude, method, literally means measurer. One of the other words used for God is shipend, shaper, right? And then we get the other passage, the, the second most famous, if you want, passage of the poem. Right. Here, Beth Fail Lana. Here, Beth Fran Lana. Here, Beth Mon Lana. Here, Beth My Lana. All this air than you stand, Edel Wertheth. Here is what? Here is wealth Lana. How does he translate Lana? Oh, I'm so glad he did. Literally loaned. Okay. What other word do we get from that lana? Modern English. Close. Lean. Like L E A N, like lean meat. We get both loaned and lean from that. Okay. Here is wealth one loaned. And two, you could say lean. In other words, even if you think you have a lot of wealth, really, what is it? It's not all that fulfilling. It's not all that nourishing, is partly what the poet is saying. Here, this friend, Lana, loaned. Why? 
because friends die. Friends leave. Here beth mon man lenna. Here beth my lenna. Kinsman. So money isn't going to last. Friends aren't going to last. Men aren't going to last. Kinsmen, family isn't going to last. All this earth, this style Eden worketh. All this earth's this style, the foundation of it, will do what? Where this will become Eden. And again, he glosses, glosses it as empty. It does mean that. I still think idle is the better word. Because according to the Christian tradition, within which this poem is written, earth is made for what? Ultimately for humanity. And if it's ultimately empty of all humanity, then it's empty of its purpose. It's no longer fulfilling its purpose. Swa quath snotor on moda, yesat him sundor at runa. Anybody want to translate that line? Just the one line. Lady? So said, yeah, so said wise man in mind to set the world before him. Okay. Set him apart. Do the at runa again. I have um, the four council. Well, I think it's council in my handwriting. Okay. Yeah. Runes are secret letters. At council, at runa means in secret council. Why is it secret council? Literally, where is it said? Yeah. He's not speaking this out. Why not? Go back to the beginning of the poem. A wise man, a virtuous man, does what? Holds it all inside. Okay? And then we get the final proverb, the final gnomic passage. Tilbith saith there his trail, ye haldeth. No, ne shall never his torn torichine, the bairn of his breastum, breastum, the cuban nymphe he ertha botacum, el, excuse me, erl mid elna yefrema. So somebody do that and then we'll do the final two lines. Kill Bith. And, and bear in mind, Bith is kind of a, um, Trying to remember what the word is. I mean, it's it's the verb for to be, but it's in the future. It's kind of conditional. It shall be kind of a thing. Okay. So till this say the his trail. Somebody. I got it. All right. Worthy is he who keeps his faith. A man must never too hastily reveal his anger from his breast. Um. Can we finish that line? Yeah. Keep going. Unless he beforehand knows how to affect the remedy. Okay, stop there. Okay, so he will be worthy. It's not that he is worthy, it's he will be worthy. The one who does this. Then we get, well, bethamfe him are secteth. Frovra to fatter on heaven. The closing line has the object that we saw at the opening line. All right. But rather than Yabedith, we now have Sikkith. Sikhs. Well, well, somebody want to translate that? Go ahead, Cheryl. Go ahead, Cheryl. It will be for the one for himself to grace seek out comfort from Father in heaven, there for us all the permanent stands. Okay. Good translation. The only thing is you left out well. It will be well. Okay. 
for him who seeks out, now how do you translate by? Do you translate it grace, favor, mercy, prosperity, any one of those, you know, 12 or 13 words that I read from the dictionary? And then we get kind of an explanation of what's meant by Are. Frovra tofader on heaven. Frovra. Okay. Comfort. Comfort's not quite good enough. It's really solace. Consolation. Relief. Okay. From the Father in heaven, where us all um for us all shall be what fest nun stondeth permanence stands okay. now as i said at the beginning a lot of people many critics think these lines are entirely tacked on many critics think these lines are entirely tacked on to quote unquote christianize it but aren't some of these ideas embedded within? When you read throughout the poem, you see many of these same ideas. Okay. Um, comments, questions? Did you did you like this poem? Did it did it? I mean, it's clear I do. Um, does it resonate with you at all? See, with, with me, with my kind of person, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a loner, kind of a, you know, tend to be a pessimist, et cetera. It, you know, it just rings all my bells, so to speak. I mean, and, and there's an aspect to it that even though I'm a Christian and, you know, all that kind of stuff, there's an aspect to it that I just kind of think, you know, I could just really see somebody in Anglo-Saxon England walking away from a, a slaughter field kind of going, man, is this really what it's all about? Because so much of Anglo-Saxon poetry is about slaughter and battle. And yet, a lot of poems really question that Anglo-Saxon heroic ethic. And I think you're going to see when we get to Beowulf, even though a lot of people say, oh, Beowulf, it's just, you know, great hero. Beowulf himself does heroic deeds. But a lot of the other people don't. And the poem seems to question. And a lot of recent criticism seems to start to question some of that. Now, the seafarer, as I mentioned, is often held to be a companion to this. Okay? For the simple reason that the poet here, go back to that opening paragraph, and, and what is the speaker seeking? Right? Notice the speaker says he has been traveling the path of exile okay, for a long time. Think metaphor. What might the path of exile be? What might the new Lord be that he's seeking? God. There's a book by a critic named Alvin Lee called The Guest Hall of Eden. And he kind of reads much Old English poetry allegorical, right? And if I remember correctly, it's been a long time. It's been over 30 years since I've read that. But I'm pretty sure um, in that he reads this kind of allegorical and, and reads it because of the conclusion that is reached, that what we have at the beginning is the poet talking about the journey to God and the homeland he is seeking and the new gold friend he is speaking uh, seeking is not one who will die again because when you get to the ubi sunt passage what's the poet telling us every pleasure you seek here on earth what's going to happen to it it's all transitory exactly everything here is fleeting that's why you want permanence you want real permanence you can't seek it here you can't seek it from a gold friend you can't seek it from your family so there's throw the kinsman out 
throw the, the word out, you know, that fourfold ethic. You can't seek it from weird, throw that out. You can't seek it from personal glory, because what does that buy you? It buys you a spot by the wall where people see your bones sticking up out of the ground. You want real glory, you want real permanence, seek it from the fatter on heaven where there is real frovra. Okay? Interestingly, frovra is a word that is used many times in Beowulf. Even though Beowulf is not held, shit, let me rephrase that. Beowulf's not a quote unquote Christian poem. It's not advocating Christianity, like, for example, Dream of the Rude is, or when you translate the seafarer, the seafarer is. Okay? But it's got this this element of Christianity woven into it. And one of the things we'll talk about next semester is, is that weaving of those Christian elements done by a later interpolator. Many critics think, think it is. In fact, no less a critic than J.R.R. Tolkien thinks some of the quote unquote main Christian elements were added by a later monk. I think he's entirely wrong. And I think I'm gonna be able to prove Tolkien was entirely wrong. But that's because Tolkien wanted Beowulf to be this remnant of this kind of this pure, great Anglo-Saxon, you know, pagan poet. Okay, we'll stop there. Seafarer for next week. Next week, is that right? Yeah, Seafarer for next week. And then, I don't even remember what I said after that. Um, Is that right? Today's the third. Next week is the tenth. Yes, that's right. And then Wolf and Ed Walker. Yeah, Wolf and Ed Walker. Then on the seventeenth, um, send me your response whether or not you do want me to drop um, either drop Malden or possibly move it to the eighth. I'll let you know whether or not I can make it the eighth. Um, all right. Don't forget the papers. I think everybody's told me your topics. Uh, one comment. I was reading through your write up, the article write ups, and that kind of stuff today, and I'm still noticing a lot of, maybe not a lot, overall, in, in terms of all of you, not, you know, on a single paper. Um, but, you know, numerous grammatical errors, numerous. Uh, or a few spelling errors, things like that, things where you repeat a word or something like that, proofread. It's not hard, just do it. And if you've never heard this before, what's the best way to proofread? Anybody Read, it out loud. Read it out loud, that's one. Start at the end. Read it backwards. When you read it backwards, it's much harder for your mind to fill in the gap. That is, if there's an error, it's hard, for, and I mean literally, you know, grade course of 20% dash 10%, I'm reading from the syllabus. Do it like that, because it's harder for your mind to overlook an error that your eyes tell you is actually okay. And one of the reasons your eyes tell you okay is because you wrote it, you think, well, I wrote it, it's fine. Kind of thing, okay? So just, especially when you get to your papers, be aware of that, okay? Um, I know grammar is not emphasized nearly as much anymore as it used to, uh, but as I and, and the graduate director were emailing back and forth about something the other day, um, if you don't have quote unquote right grammar, your meaning is not, grammar meaning the rules of grammar. The, Subject verb agreement, sentence fragments, comma splices, you know, all that kind of thing. If if you don't follow those basic kind of rules, your meaning won't get across. If your meaning don't won't get across, you won't do well. Just a little word of advice. All right. We will stop there. I hope you enjoyed this poem. That's all, unless there's any other comments.